Disney property? Yes. I, I, as a matter of fact, what we're looking at, what we're talking about is straight up getting a room and paying money to stay at the Polynesian home of Trader Sam's and, yeah. and, and one monorail ride away from all the adventures. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, hey, let me uh, put you in touch with my, my sister-in-law. She works uh, at the Disney uh, Hotel Park thing. Oh, fantastic. So, yeah, so she'd be, she might be able to hook up. Uh, but I would say, yeah, that or um, you know, she actually hooked us up with uh, the Animal Kingdom Oh, to hotel. do the, like the, uh, the, oh, 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 the shit where like the drabs are hanging out outside your yeah, balcony door. Yeah, so door. it's like, and, and like she did the little like, like it's, it's not guaranteed, right? Because it's like a day of kind of thing, but she can like put in the little note of like, hey, I know that this is definitely for the pool view, but uh, if there is one available, then switch them on over to the, uh, to the, to the animal view. But that's like that's some magical stuff when you just like wake up and see a bunch of giraffes and stuff like that just walking outside your room. Yeah, I just saw. I just got a DM. I got a DM at three twenty in the morning from Jeff Bryant Davis. Oh shit! I DM'd him saying, uh, "Hey man, just finished the last episode. Wanted to say thanks so much for all you put into the gift of Harmontown. Can't wait to hear what comes next." And Fox News alert. He says, "Yeah, thank you. More to come." Mm. So number one, we know that Jeff Ryan Davis is a class act. Number two, we yeah. know, as was repeatedly announced, there's going to be more to come. <laughs> but uh, but it occurs to me that, um, uh, and this is this is it's just us chat realmies here, right? I mean, we are attempting to be online as much as we are able. So that's yes. fine. That's fine. If somebody hears us, that's fine. Um, seems to me like when somebody's, you know, launching a podcast, they tend to be interested in, uh, you know, working with other people to get the word out. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, if there was ever a chance to get a chance for a chance, oh, yeah. that this would be it. Oh, well, totally. if someone who uh, could DM with that person uh, would be... A yeah. good person to fulfill that promise. <laughs> that prama. <laughs> I like prama as like you don't have time to say the whole word. <laughs> fulfill that prama. All right. Yeah. Um. Hmm. So, uh, there's a little there's a little tile here that I don't like seeing being read a little too much, but I. Th- think it's not on our side. So Dead Polymer says audio is good, but the video is sketchy. Yeah. So like if I do this, you, you, you won't need to do that. What there there's sketchiness is that it'll actually stop and buffer. I mean, you yeah, can but do I can whatever still you do like, this, right? You're yeah. not going to stop me. Should be okay now, or it looks okay now, but it's going to be touch and go for a bit here. So, uh, please stick around for us. We're, we're going to be streaming it out. As long as as long as the show's on. So uh, if yep. there's an issue, hit hit refresh. Everybody's having some technical issues today, huh? All righty. Uh, but I think we're good to go here on my side. Andrew, if you're good to go. I am good to go. All right, then take it away in three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Justin Robert Young. Hey, friends. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. So, uh, <clears throat> what'd you do this morning, Brian? <laughs> this morning, uh, drove my kid to school, listened to a bit of a Jonathan Haidt, as one does, then uh, came back and I was trying to watch that Mr. Robot uh, episode, but then I found myself sucked into the buzz around a little Python script game called AI Dungeon 2. Uh, that was so hard for me to put together, it was its own three-hour experience. I got to learn how GitHub works and what cells are and how to copy and paste Python scripts into a Google Drive. Make sure you have 13 gigabytes free, folks. But don't worry, you have come with 15 free if you create a new account. And then <laughs> executing multiple scripts to get it to run for about seven turns before it totally craters. <laughs> but having said all of that, 
it was still freaking amazing. J Justin, do you know anything about this game? I know that somebody tweeted at us earlier today, so I am familiar with the general concept, but if, if I were to describe it, it would be an AI-generated word, uh, you know, a word-based dungeon crawler. So it is it is giving you all of the kind of like D and D prompts, and then you are telling it what actions you're taking. Yeah, it's actually shockingly close to a a failed experiment where on Twitter I was joking about the idea of somebody who who would be a full time dungeon master, and you could just play a game that goes literally anywhere. You never meet this person, you never who they, know who they are, but you could just say and do and go and be anything. Uh, and and out of <laughs> I said this on Twitter, and then all of a sudden somebody just at replies me, "You're standing in a room." <laughs> and so we started going back and forth, but then it started to feel like work to both of us. And so it ended up not going anywhere. Enter so, this neural net AI dungeon that, that can basic I get a quick backstory on it. Though? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Remember we talked about uh, GPT two, the open AI, uh, the text generation system where, you know, we we've done a couple stories on this, where we read the stories that it generated. Oh, this, yeah, is yeah, that, yeah. this is that what oh. these researchers did is they took that and they fed it a bunch of choose-your-own-adventure stories or choose-your-own from a website. So they just took that same engine and fed it a ton of those. And so that's what you were downloading was the finished model it created. That's why it was so huge. So this is this is the OpenAI's GPT-2 just programmed with a ton of those. Yeah, so uh, I, I did get it working. And uh, what happens is, is I, I believe I'm hitting a memory error. And by the way, if you're interested in this, there's a fantastic community on reddit.com slash r slash AI Dungeon 2 or AI Dungeon, I forget which. But um, uh, Bryce, if you're able to pull up my my one longest adventure, I, I, where, uh, uh, I, I just where on my Twitter feed, you'll, you'll see me post it there. Uh, the, uh, so, so. I understand that there's ways to allocate memory so that it more likely continues on, and it's all very much in beta. Uh, but but here we go. So this was my adventure that I, that I had. Uh, <laughs> it says, "You are Shudro, a noble living in the kingdom of Larian. You have a pouch of gold and a small dagger. You are awakened by one of your servants who tells you that your keep is under attack. You look at the window and see an army of orcs charging towards the door." Run, you shout to your servant. I will hold them off. The, the next morning, you wake up and find yourself surrounded by orcs. Uh, me. Uh, uh, you ask for the leader. Uh, and by the way, there's some debate, uh, like what's the best way to tease the best answer out of the AI bots is whether to use first person or second person on all that. And so uh, I had seen somebody say that, that using se uh, second person uh, was better. So I say, uh, you shout for the leader. Uh, uh, he says, uh, uh, you, you look around and see several orcs with their faces covered by masks. They po all point to each other and then point at you. Who are you? They say in unison. And then me, I say, I am the, uh, or I am the leader of this band of raiders. And I say, demand the orcs. Like at this point, I can't believe, like, am I already in charge of these orcs that were just trying to take down my castle? <laughs> so I say, demand the orcs bow to you. And it says, you raise your hand and the orcs, the orcs bow before you. Then turn to your servant and tell him to get ready to fight. He nods and runs out of the room. The rest of the orcs follow suit. Now let's go. And then I say, say, I am the Lord of the Orcs. We shall pillage every city for miles around. And again, I can't believe that I'm already being granted this power. <laughs> and then the response is, the Orcs nod and begin to chant, quote, we will pillage every city for miles around. Quote, we will bring our enemies low. <laughs> quote, our master is great. <laughs> My next command is, run to Gary's butcher shop. <laughs> It says you enter Gary's butcher shop and find that it has been completely looted. There is a sign. There is no sign of Gary anywhere. You search the place but can't find anything useful. Uh, and I say, ask the orcs to burn down the shop. It says you grab an axe from one of the dead bodies and shout, "Burn the shop down!" And then I say, run to Larry's computer repair center. <laughs> So we run to Larry's <laughs> computer repair center and I say, steal a TRS-80. It says, you walk into the computer repair shop and start searching for a TRS-80. You quickly find that you find one and try to take it. However, the owner of the shop grabs your hand uh, or grabs your arm and tells you not to touch the machine. <laughs> At which point there is a follow-up where I, I ask him, I try to convince him and he says, fine, 
you can borrow it and I play it until I get bored. <laughs> <laughs> But like so, the the flexibility is extraordinary on this thing. What it but it's what it lacks is context is that each time you give it a response, it has no idea of what you said before. And so it doesn't like it it's the orcs are behaving each new iterage iteration. It's not saying you're in a room full of orcs if you say tell the orc commander, and that's why it changed the place. So it's fun until you realize, oh, it's I'm not playing a narrative. It's just responding to that one sentence. It's, it's, it's waiting. Well, what it is is it's pretending to be the dungeon master, but it's letting you be the dungeon master. Uh, one of the bits of advice is, that they give on the subreddit for this is they say use the words attempt to because if you just say I mount the horse, then it's going to mm. say uh, – you're on a horse. But if you say attempt to mount the horse, then there's a chance that it's like, well, you get halfway up on the horse and then the horse bucks, you fall down and then it hits you again, striking you in the stomach. And now you have, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, pancreatitis or whatever. Yeah. But then in the next thing, it doesn't know that there's a horse or anything. Each one is a new, completely new generation oh, I, based I, on. I, I, I got the impression that, that it's sort of, kept a running inventory. I, I, again, I've played all of 30 minutes, but, but I, I, I had the perception that if I told the orcs from the beginning without having established myself as their leader, that they wouldn't be available in my, in, in my inventory. But, but I may be wrong on that. Yeah. Um, it's a fun, it's fun to see what you can do even without context, even with it just basically in training a set on those sort of adventure stories. And, and like you said, by using the terms like attempt to, it leaves it more open-ended. It's not trying to complete the phrase of I did this. And this is just early, early stages, you know? Uh, there... uh, it is, it is a, a remarkable idea. And it is so fun. Brian, it, it, when you were playing it, does it have any kind of, like, uh, uh, hit points? Or or are you, like... Uh, 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 I, is, I, I know is... you can die. As a matter of fact, if if you if Bryce is able to call up uh, the that subreddit, uh, it's pretty amazing because people are sharing their stories. And I've seen a number of them that end, <laughs> begin and end in just one page and, like, seven actions. And uh, in, no, in one it... case, like... Uh, Captain William Kidd is trying to steal a boat, and then there's a bunch of dialogue back and forth between the two. And apparently, that's where the real fun is: is to is to say to somebody, you know, quote blank blank blank, and then have them respond. Oh, uh, yeah, here we go. The Adventures of the Unnamed Captain. Uh, uh, if you can make that big, Bryce, can you can you can you uh, 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 be, you could be the character in this? So so I'll be the computer. Okay. You are a pirate captain running from the law. You are sailing into port when suddenly you hear a voice calling out to you. Listen. You turn around and see a man with a long beard approaching you. He has short brown hair and wears a leather jacket over a t-shirt. His eyes are set in a serious manner, but his face is calm. Quote, I am Captain William Kidd, he says. Uh, quote, Ahoy, Captain Kidd. What brings you aboard my vessel? Quote, I have been sailing for years, but I've never had much luck until recently. My crew is getting restless, so I thought it would, it would be best if I took this ship for, uh, on as my own. You reply. <laughs> the weird, it says you reply as if that quote was said by me also. <laughs> yeah. Uh, quote, you'll have to take it from my cold, dead hands. Quote, if that's what you want, very well, Captain Kidd nods at you. Draw pistol and shoot, Captain Kidd. You draw your pistol and fire. The bullet hits Kid square in the chest. He falls backwards onto the deck of the ship, clutching his chest. You quickly reload your pistol. <laughs> you quickly reload your pistol uh, and aim at Kid again. This time you fire again. The shot hits him square in the chest. Quote, had enough? Before turning his back to the captain. Quote, what was the point of all of this? We're just going to kill him now? The captain looks up at you, tears streaming down his face. <laughs> Throw Kid overboard. You toss Kid overboard into the ocean. He screams as he goes under the waves. Uh, tell crew, quote, there will be no tolerance for mutiny aboard this ship. <laughs> you order the crew to stop complaining about their treatment and get back to work. You also give them a new set of orders. There will be no more complaints. After a few days, the crew returns to the usual behavior. They complain less, but they still don't get along. 
Uh, uh, head to port for supplies. You head to port to get some supplies. When you arrive, you find that the ship is not in any condition to sail further. There are holes in the hull. Water leaks everywhere, and the sails are torn off. You wonder how you can fix it. I tell Harbor Master, quote, send someone to repair my ship. You tell the harbor master to send someone to repair your ship. He agrees and sends two men. They manage to patch up the damage, but the ship is still not seaworthy. It takes several months to repair the ship sufficiently to make it seaworthy again. Uh, set sail. You set sail, hoping that the repairs will be successful. Unfortunately, the repairs do not succeed. The ship sinks without trace, and you die. <laughs> <laughs> Like that's a complete story, and it seems like like the robot understood everything oh, the entire what, time. What it's doing is, I should clarify. What it's doing is, it's taking every past response and reply that you have, and then sent, feeding that in. So you put in your sentence. So it takes all like a X number of whatever responses before and feeds that back in. So it's continuing on that narrative based on there, but and that's why you're getting that sense of context from those replies. But it's not like. A, it doesn't have an inventory in the sense of like it X number of ships, or it's not telling a narrative, but it gives you that first sentence thing that tells you, you give it a response. It feeds that back in and be, goes back in and it keeps a certain number of them because after a certain point, it gets really heavy overhead. So this, but so this is, this is not a thing where in each adventure, the, the AI knows that there are 14 treasures and, you know, uh, six boats available and, you you know like it's not it's not a land that you are then exploring. It is one by one determined by your past actions. It is replicating, the, or it, it is creating the next step ahead. Yeah, and it's when it's taking those things that happened before, but it, and it's trying, it's doing its best to sort of generate a response that most likely responds to that. Um, and that was the thing, which is when we played the regular Open GP two, you know, the 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 the, the system is that. It's cool because it comes with spawn and it can create an article because it says these are the first two lines. This is what comes next. Remember the whole article about unicorns, you know, in the Andes Mountains? Yeah. Is it, it could generate an entire thing because it said what would follow this sentence? What will follow that sentence? What will follow that sentence? It doesn't really necessarily grasp. I mean, it knows that like you hear ships and repairs because there's enough text in there to tell about ships and repairs and stuff. It'll generate something along the lines of that. But it's not. Uh, it's not like a, a kind of a centrally sort of game engine sort of thing that's tracking things. It's literally looking at that text and taking a billion different responses on some choose your own adventure sort of site and trying to say this is what probably would be the most likely response, which is amazing. It's 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 it's, it's this fun and this is just the start. Well, and I, I think that much like we're seeing with uh, various chess teams or whatever, the next phase will be some kind of human AI hybrid where it's like a human. It takes extraordinary bandwidth to design an entire town and tell a backstory or whatever. But it's like a human can say eh, it's roughly a medieval town uh, of, of a population of 30,000 people and then the details get filled out by the AI. And then when you get to a significant question where it's like, okay, it seems like they're probing, trying to assert authority or wanting to run an election or uh, physically attack another town or whatever, then you could get the guidance of, of, of a human on, on that kind of stuff. But, but for, for what it is, man, is it a fun toy to play with? And, and you know, it's, it's, it's like a silly, was it Eliza? Was that the AI that basically just Eliza, yeah. kept asking like, well, how do you feel about that? And then was able to convince people that it was real. Yeah, that was because if you're, the, the, if you were extremely narcissistic, you never noticed. And that was literally like when they did like research on this, because some, some people would talk to her for an hour because Eliza would just go like, well, how are you? How was your day? And, and people like, oh, da, 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 da. Never stopping to think, was the recipient really paying attention to what I was doing, you know, uh, right. or not? And so it was one of these things where um, it was just, I got, it was doing young in and out. What is it? You have the page there. See if it was based upon some sort of like therapy where they just sort of ask you, oh, we're Jerry and yeah. So, um, but you know, it's, 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 we get better. These things get better and better so and better for people. If, if you are technically minded and you can grasp what it means to download a Python script, copy it over to a Google drive and follow a bunch of GitHub cell snippets in order to get a thing working, you can start playing now. Uh, I would probably guess within a week, given how popular this is and how fast word is spreading, 
that you'll probably be able to just eh, just look for AI Dungeon 2. And, and my guess is at some point you'll be able to run it on their site fairly easily. Yeah. So behind the scenes, what it does is that there, you know, it has this neural network model, right? Which is this big, huge model. It's filled with tons of, you know, uh, data. And I mean, however you want to talk about how like you know, a neural network is constructed and it's huge. How many gigabytes did you say the download was? It was like a uh, six or seven. Uh, the, I, it, it caused me, man, I cannot think, I think it's been eight or nine years since the last time I've run any BitTorrent client, but they were so slammed that they're like, best thing is to just download all these files and then get them up and please seed them so that you can spread them around. Yeah, because what happened was they had this thing in a, uh, there's a called like a, like a Google Colab notebook where you can run, like if you're running different kinds of like uh, uh, machine learning systems, things like that, tensors or whatever like that. And they had it where like, oh, you can download the model from here. And the way it was configured is people were downloading the model and at seven gigabytes per model and you had tens of thousands of downloads, they were caught it was costing them ten thousand dollars a day in downloads. It was insane. I mean, uh which 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 by the way is the exact same problem that what red versus blue had, rooster teeth in the very early days, uh before there were easy solutions, but nowadays there's easy solutions. So it makes sense that they that they're sort of putting everything but behind a paywall of effort and understanding. It took me about an hour to really understand how the Google Docs environment worked and, and what the rules were. It's pretty easy. If, if you don't mind just continuously Googling uh, how does blank or what does this mean and so on, yeah, you could get there. They yeah. say that they it's are working experiment. on a model, a version of the app where it is host. the model is hosted on the cloud and play, players can play on any device per their Patreon. Can, can we yeah, uh, can we give a shout out to the guy who recommended this to us uh, for weird things? Uh, David uh, Potsiadlo, I believe. Uh, David yeah, I had Potts. a couple people email it, and it was been had a hacker news for like two weeks. Yeah, too, so it's no, it's great. Uh, it, it, this morning was the first time it popped on my radar, so I appreciate being uh, thought of. Yeah, no, for sure. I, and by all means, just because I'm like I heard about it, please send us because we stuff. There's more stuff than we can keep track of, folks. Man, this is, what if was people want to, to keep track of all of our adventures here at weirdthings.com? Yeah, that's where you can support us if you go to patreon.com slash weirdthings. This ain't no AI dungeon. It's a real website where you can go ahead and give us real money. Uh, thank you to everybody who has already done it. And thank you even more if you plan on doing it right now. That is patreon.com slash weirdthings. You know, I am all for hobbyists and experimenting in the spirit of research. Uh, you know, for instance, our, our good friend Brian here and his buddies, they get up to all sorts of shenanigans trying crazy things. But uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to see if we can one-up you for the modern rogue there, Brian. You ready? Oh, no, I'm ready. Bring it. Have you guys thought about building your own quantum physics generator? Oh, okay. I fold instantly. <laughs> I give up the, the big blind. It's fine. Uh, so uh, this was in the news. And uh, Bryce, just do a, little, just do a little Google News for your quantum physics generator and then show them the results. Oh, my God. I found, I found, oh, my God. Okay, so uh, <laughs> what this, is going on? This is the top result. Wait, for wait, quantum... wait, Bryce, don't show them anything. Uh, well, Here, well, I'll, then... I'll block it out. I'm good. I'm good. What, what, what do you want me to do? What do you, what do you want? That's Brian and Justin. Like, what do you think when I say this in Bryce's reaction? Well, okay. From Bryce's reaction, I'm thinking it's some kind of like next level pseudoscientific nonsense. Like, like what the bleep do we know? Did you manage to sit through that whole movie back in the day? Uh, I, I had to, I think when I worked for the chair, if I had to watch part of it or whatever, and it just, it was just, infuriating to watch a movie where basically you're saying, so you blame children who are sick. It's their own fault. Got it. Okay. There's a, a it is, it is, it is a, a, an hour and a half embodiment of the sentiment of, I forget what scientists said it, but it was some version of the quote, look, just because things get a little bit nutty at the subatomic level, doesn't mean all bets are off. <laughs> like it doesn't yeah. mean that suddenly <laughs> wishing for things makes them true or, or that you can attract magic in it with your thoughts or whatever. Yeah. I just remember the interview where they said, cause they're talking about how all illness is really because of a state of mind. They're like, 
So children suffering from like diseases, like terminal deals, disease, and like, well, basically, like, so seven year old girl with leukemia, it's her fault. Like, well, I wouldn't put it that way, but like, it's literally what you said. Well, you know, positive thinking, blah, blah, blah. It's like, holy cow. <laughs> well, and, and I'm sure that in their minds, they want to believe that positive thinking can lead a child out of leukemia, but they don't realize that if they're proposing a set of rules, they go both ways, right? <laughs> oh, oh, no, <laughs> I mean, they, they flat out said these things are caused by negative thoughts and stuff. I mean, they were like, there, that was confronted like, like, well, yes, we do believe this kind of thing. And it was like, blaming people for their disease. That's great. Sure. So, so in that case, uh, this is the nightmare that I'm, that I'm expecting on the Google news thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, by the, by the reaction, I'm playing the reaction at this point, but I, I would suspect that it is something comically low rent, like it, that it, that it We lost Justin for a second there, but uh, uh, Bryce, you want to walk us through this? Um, sh sure. Uh, is Justin, Justin, are you still on the line? Oh. Oh, we're doing a pause moment. All right. Yeah, I'd rather. I was pause trying to keep. I don't know where he is. Trying to save it. <clears throat> um, Hello, beautiful people watching live at twitch.tv slash night attack. Thank you so much for joining us. We apologize as we are experiencing a number of technical difficulties. Hopefully we can get him back on the line here. I can see the reflection of the same news story in your monitor, Andrew. Oh, I'm looking what's away. it? Uh, I'm not going to look. I could tell I've got that exact same news story pulled up. Yeah. See. <laughs> Uh oh, I think I think we might have lost Justin here. Uh, all right, let me text him as much. Looks like we lost you. You see the Twitter stream? Twitter stream. Yeah, the twit that's the series of twits on tweets on Raw Story, the twits. Uh oh no, I haven't I'll send even scrolled this, down to that. I'll send yet. this to you. I got it. I got the the, the article. You just got, got everything, right? I got Fine. It. I, got, I just told you I had You're, everything. Do people want to copy your notes in school and stuff? Or they're like, <laughs> uh, Justin, is that you? Are you here? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. You, you're on your phone now. I'm on my phone now. Yeah, I got that kissed. <laughs> Internet dropped out. All right. Oh, no. Hey okay, well, let's uh, let, let's ask Justin what he thinks of uh, of of our reactions one more time, and we'll bring it in there. Uh, all right. So, so yeah, you want, you want me to say what my thought was, or yeah, 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 we'll take it back there. All right. So I think it's going to be something comically low rent, something that that makes uh, uh, Heisenberg's meth lab look like uh, Epcot. <laughs> So we've got this story. This is from rawstory.com. I'll just, should I start with the headline, Andrew? Quantum. Uh, I, I kind of, I don't know if you want to start there or if we want to start from the, the, like the first tweet of like, start with the first tweet, sure. like December okay. the 5, 18 PM one. Five. Okay. Yeah. So this is from at Dan Perlman hazmat update CFD about 20 duplexes have been evacuated on chip and hook court after a man called nine one one and said he was burned while working on a quantum physics generator in his garage. <laughs> he mentioned alpha waves prompting concerns of radiation. No contaminants found so oh far. My God. Okay. Okay. So, so if I'm guessing where this goes, knowing that this is the seed, I'm going to guess that it's some version of a nonsense hysteria, like as if the China syndrome was happening in your backyard by a bunch of people who don't understand how quantum physics or the China syndrome works. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's really like there's just one idiot at the center of this and extra people acting appropriately cautious and safe. It's really mm -hmm. like there's just one, one, and so like the next tweet is, because uh, remember, this guy called out, I've been burned by my quantum physics generator. There <laughs> and so like, you know, you're you're firefighters. And you're like, mm -hmm. well, we have procedures to handle this. And it's better to follow the procedures than not, you know, watch. Yeah. Chernobyl, you know, is this sure. Like, like, yeah, I de I'm not sure I know what quantum physics generator is, but I know what the word burned means. And my job is to treat yeah. burns. 
Yeah. And also, yeah, and I'm sure at that point you're going through all your training on on the appropriate people you need to talk to and uh, uh, you need to you'd follow. And oh my God, I can't imagine what this this Yahoo the, the kind of noise that this Yahoo made. And and even if you don't know somebody or or if you don't remember, yeah, at this point you're calling your contacts who know something about uh, dealing with uh, radiation burns and maybe maybe you saw. Uh, yeah, uh, you saw Chernobyl on the HBO or something, and so you're like, well, you know that early response really matters if there's some kind of significant thing. So they yeah. said next tweet was, crews are here from AEP Ohio or here near Chickenhook Court because firefighters found a device that may be used as a capacitor, which the caller says is a quantum physics generator. Firefighters say AEP would need to de-energize the device if it is a capacitor. Okay, now that sounds pretty fancy, but but if 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 you're not savvy to science talk, uh, uh, batteries are things that generate a certain amount of electricity at, at a a predictable level. You you got two whatever uh, you have an and anode, capacitors anode are and swimming pool or whatever. That uh, just uh, whereas a capacitor out. does have it's basically a bucket. So imagine mm -hmm. a battery spends a lot of time putting a lot of energy into a bucket, and it could all be discharged at once. As a matter of fact, we did a modern rogue where we took the capacitor from a disposable camera and uh, charged it up and then used it as a, 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 a taser, kind of a shock device where it discharged it all at once. It was very unpleasant to have somebody stab you with that and have like a shock happen on there. So if it is a capacitor at this point, there is legitimate cause to think like, we don't know how big this electricity bucket is. We don't know how full it is. We would need to discharge it. That all seems pretty reasonable in terms of the information that you've gotten so far on the, twi the Twitter feed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the situation at Chippenhook Court has been contained. The device thought to possibly be a capacitor was not functional. One firefighter suffered a sprained ankle, no other injuries. Oh, no! Next one. The, the caller sprain, will be the admitted to hospital. The sprained ankle is the one like, do you want to be the guy who got injured on this call? <laughs> <laughs> the, the next one is the caller will be admitted to the hospital for evaluation. Fire investigators also say he will be charged with inducing panic. Well, so the panic uh, is, I think, illustrated well from this Fox 13 uh, headline. Mm -hmm. Nuclear device report evacuates Ohio neighborhood. No hazard found. Did somebody hear the word quantum and just conflate it with nuclear or well, atomic? Well, remember, we have a caller who was calling up 911 and saying things that were, as far mm -hmm. as we understand, patently untrue about yeah. alpha waves and stuff like that. So... Yeah, the uh, alpha he waves said, and trickle accelerator, all this sort of stuff. So he basically <sighs> swatted himself, basically, by 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 saying enough trigger words that caused something to get escalated to a level of importance. Well, he did I mean, probably yeah, consider you know, you know, it important. Like he did yeah, probably think it was dangerous. You know that phrase, uh, "smart enough to be dangerous." Sure. <laughs> like, that. <laughs> That this is the definition of that. He, he knows enough of these words to say them in a in a manner of speaking that for a bunch of other people that are just trying to keep the peace, uh, they you know are googling these words or, or they know enough of these words to know that this is something really serious. And next thing you know, somebody sprains their ankle because this dude had an erector set. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So everybody's okay. Did did he actually even get burned? Uh, I don't. I'm trying to find a follow up here, and Google News is frozen on me. Um, but man, if only people would go to Patreon.com/slash Weird Things, we could afford an entire wing of investigators. We'd have that dude live on the line right now. <laughs> yeah. Per these two articles I see, they just say that he will go a mental evaluation. I imagine if there were burns, that some that they would have seen it on site and reported it. Yeah, I think the only burns were sick burns on on cognition. <laughs> <laughs> this. Reminds me, remember the whole balloon boy thing? Yep. Where yep. you're like, man, this feels, this is fishy. How'd a kid fit in there? Da 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 da. And then, hey, guess what? It was BS. <laughs> you know? Yeah. We actually just had the anniversary of that not too long ago, right? And it was like a couple, couple weeks ago was was the big. I think it was like a ten year anniversary of of balloon boy. Yeah. Yeah. October two thousand nine. October fifteen two thousand nine. <sighs> Can't believe. Wow. Yeah. And by the way, to this day, the the now teenage uh, uh, balloon boy maintains that that this was indeed not a hoax. I mean, look uh, at, at at the age of let's say he's nineteen. At the age of nine, 
uh, with any consistent reinforcement, you can get any nine-year-old to truly believe literally anything. And, and uh, he will manufacture a vague, half-remembered hallucination, but, but the more you rehearse that in your mind, it becomes a true memory in your mind. So I don't, I don't doubt that he believes it all really happened. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, fascinating story, though. That was, I mean, like, like, yeah. was that was that the beginning of? I mean, because obviously this feels very internet significant, but maybe it was just because like it was the first time that everybody could react to things on YouTube. Was Twitter around? No. Yes. Yes. Oh, oh, I, I remember so, yeah, the like a year two thousand nine. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the. I remember. I have the CNN book tweet bookmarked saying that there's a boy up in a balloon. <laughs> that was a yeah uh, there are sometimes uh, we, we we talk about when it comes to storytelling we talk about a uh, uh, niche uh, type and spice you know the idea that there's the structure of whatever your story is there's the uh, uh, the the thing that makes it kind of wacky but then the niche is the most important one that's sort of what i think of as like the black hole of storytelling in the universe and if somebody wants if the world wants a story enough the world won't be overly concerned with how true the story that they're getting is. And this definitely felt like everything was primed for something to set fire. There, there, there was a event horizon that this story was just the right story of the, the narrative of the wacky backyard scientist and his son caught up in a, you know, in a balloon. Well, the, the other thing, Brian, is the key in on the word event is it was an ongoing thing was, hey, we heard about a thing that's happening and so, News helicopters were trying to follow it, all of this. And so it's like a David Blaine stunt. You know, the way the way to pull that off is you don't tell everybody, hey, I'm going to go do this thing Tuesday for one hour. Is you say, I'm going to go do this thing starting Tuesday. A few people show up on Tuesday. Other people see that people showed their Tuesday. So on Wednesday, you got a bigger crowd. And then the news covers the big crowd there. Then by Friday, it's an international story. And, and this, this is also perfectly timed as we all of humanity suddenly has a chat room in the form of Twitter. So it's easy to, sp to spread information without vetting it uh, before we ever thought of that, that kind of thing. Yep. I'm just looking through the details. The man who is in his late 20s or 30s and who resides at the 6300 block called 911, called 911 at about 16, 16, 15 p.m., and I just got one of these Google like take take this survey. <laughs> oh geez. Uh uh 615 th Thursday. Is there any other details here? Um yeah, no no other. Um so I guess the man's description of the device suggested he was working on a small nuclear reactor, included reference to particle accelerators and alpha waves. Um but yeah, um yeah, it sounds no offense, man. Could be pissing off one of our patrons here, but it sounds like <laughs> it's like a like a goofball. By goof the way, ball. if you are our yeah. patron, congratulations. You get to have a full hour dedicated to talk about whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, we get this too a lot is yeah, when I work for the 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 James Randy Foundation, you get people who are, you know, oh, I've come up with a perpetual motion or they would never call it that. They'd call it, you know, over you you know over you know unity whatever sort of different terms and phrases they would do An to avoid the positive, things that, the triggers uh, engine yeah and you just you encounter this a lot where it's you could be skeptical like well I think this has problems and they're like ah you just don't understand and it's like maybe maybe you don't <laughs> you know it's this you know I've got a pet theory on how these things work and I think. I'm all for garage experimentation, though. I don't want to discourage anybody from, you know, doing anything here. Um, I wonder if it was like a Farnsworth thing, he, a Farnsworth fuser he built. Because those are relatively accessible. They're, it's it Basically, you can build a fusion device in your own home if you want. Um, and this was actually by the guy, one of the pioneers of television, developed the Farnsworth fuser. Oh, which... I, 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 am I right in understanding, like, it's not the fusion part that's tricky. It's making it energy positive that's tricky. Like, the yeah. sun does it, but we've not figured out how to make it energy positive. Like, fusion bombs obviously conduct fusion, but, but, but at the expense of eating up the resource as they're doing it, right? 
we don't have a fusion bomb. That would be very scary if we did. But, Wait, but I, like, hold, um, hold on. Have, there is no fusion bombs. Maybe no, I'm the trigger. Confused. Sorry, you're right. Yes, you're you're correct. I thought yes, absolutely correct. Um, I was I was thinking of a the the other thing which was the one that would not the non-stop fusion bomb which would oh correct correct right, correct yeah that would be very yeah, yeah. very sorry, scary sorry, my apologies <laughs> but but, but I got basically panicked there for like, no we don't have one we can't have one <laughs> we'll in, die in, in that case that is an explosion that is net energy negative right uh it, whereas what we want is a fusion reactor that is net energy positive where we're just feeding in hydrogen that becomes helium and so on yeah, exactly. You want it to you know, produce more energy than it takes in. It's like a Farnsworth fuser. If, if you look that up, um, you can see that basically it's you know it's a kind of a cool sort of thing where it glows and you're basically you know creating this this sort of fuser sort of thing. And I've met like high school kids who built them. You know, it's it's a slightly technical kind of thing, but you know, and very very cool. You know, there's a lot of cool stuff there. You see that like it's got that that like, kind of like Doctor Manhattan sort of symbol in the center. Or basically, you create this electrical field, and uh, it starts to glow inside of there. And, so. and all it's doing is inputting hydrogen, exporting helium at the expense of the energy that goes into it, right? Yeah, it just takes a hell of so, a lot, tremendous amount of energy uh, to do that. Sim similar to the electrolysis, like if you take uh, take your cell phone charger and uh, uh, tear off the end of it, split apart the negative and the positive thing, uh, in, and just stick it into uh, salt water then you'll see bubbles forming around it because there'll be electricity, direct current going through, and it, it takes energy, but you'll be pulling out the, uh, the hydrogen on one, uh, uh, one node and uh, oxygen yeah. on the other. So it seems like same thing, but for fusion. Wow, it sounds overly reductionist when I put it this way. <laughs> well, in that, what you just described, though, Ryan, that was purely a chemical process. Okay. And so you're... you're you were, you were, this is literally like, this is, this is theoretically in some point it's ionizing this stuff to the point that some of those hydrogen might be fusing into helium. And so where the splitting oxygen, hydrogen apart is a chemical process. This is fusion, you know, so this takes place very, I don't know if you can even really measure the amount that it's theoretically produced, but, um, it's, you know, it's neat, you know, and then trying to scale these things up. But, you know, it's one of these things where there was a lot of research on this early on. They realized you're just never going to make this thing more powerful. Do you then I, I wonder how far off the energy curve is knowing that because the story that I always hear is that helium is finite and there's going to be a time that we won't use helium for balloons. But if you know, if, if 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 theoretically energy gets cheaper and cheaper, which it seems to be doing as we are, a, you know, solar gets better, wind gets better and so on, then why not use that to manufacture helium? Uh, to uh, to use for balloons. Well, step one is the energy, the amount of energy that it would take to do that, to, that it would take to produce just a tiny amounts of it would be immensely expensive. You're talking millions of dollars per okay. like, you, you know. So, so the, the thing gap is, like, is much the, the, wider than than I'm picturing. Well, and also the thing with the, the helium thing is that we there's abundant amounts of helium, but because every time you put extract natural gas, you get helium when you do that. It's just the process to to collect that natural collect the helium to do that, whatever. We don't bother doing that. And there's there's sort of been like we've done all sorts of weird things with pricing and stuff on helium, which just makes it not worthwhile for anybody to really try to get into helium production. But the actual amount of the there's what they call the strategic helium reserve where they store it, but then the actual like amounts of helium that we have is tremendous. You know, we're not really going to run out of it anytime in the foreseeable future. It's just that we've done so many market things to make it, you know, impractical, you know. Right. It's Th like, there's a difference between helium and cheap helium. So maybe yeah. maybe we are about to run out of cheap helium, but as we've seen, and and this is a whole separate discussion. We've talked about the work of economist Julian Simon and all that stuff where it's like, in general, humans, clever creatures, they tend to figure out a way to get more of a thing when they want it. Yeah. 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 It turns out in the universe, there's an awful lot of helium. <laughs> awful <laughs> lot. But uh, so we'll see. But, you know, if you have helium and you'd like us to have it, please send it into weird things. We'd like <laughs> to have your helium. Um, There's also like different... <laughs> They're different grades of helium too. Like the stuff you get at the party supply store, it's not like straight up pure helium and it's sort of a mix. And uh, you know, if you're using stuff for industrial applications, you use a different grade of helium because it has to go through a finer process because to make it 
you know, 90% helium is enough for balloons and stuff. But in certain applications, like if you're building, let's say, you know, a helium airship, you know, that's 10% weight, 10% whatever. So, um, a lot yeah, of variability. No, it definitely there. makes a, a difference. Whereas, like, if you just want a mylar balloon to float, you can you can put a little nitrogen in there. Ain't nobody going to complain. Mylar balloons are still amazing to me. They really are. I mean, mylar. Yeah. Look, man, science is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's Technology. my hot take. I'm for it. <laughs> I just, it's shiny, and it floats, and it looks like metal. Just we, we talked about a while ago, a long time ago, what they had, like the 1930s, that... We actually had metal airships. There was the uh, the ZC, which stands for the zinc clad, which the Navy built a airship out of this basically a, a proto kind of zinc sort of material, not a, quite aluminum, whatever. And like just incredible to think about that. I mean, it would have you know pushed thinner than a coke can, but kind of amazing that you know we could have done that. I digress, gentlemen. Let's do picks. I got a pick. I made my children watch Gattaca. And um, number one, spoiler alert, it holds up. It's delightful. I think they made some really smart decisions. What was it, 1990, mid-90s uh, it came out? Um, uh, number one, it's set in the future, but a clever trick, if you're going to set something in the future, is model everything on something from the past. And in this case, mm -hmm. all of the clothing, all of the styles, everything feels mid-40s, maybe early 50s-ish or whatever. Um, it sets up this idea of a kind of a new racism that is technically illegal, but rampant between those who are designed from birth and those who are, as they're called, godchildren. Uh, you know, just you know, whatever. Let let fate roll the dice on them. And uh, I, it was interesting because my 12 year old got it, and she tends to be really dialed in on emotional aspects. She doesn't mind that it's a romance story or whatever. My 15 year old, not a fan of romance stories. Not a fan of stories that make you think and put you in uncomfortable ethical positions. Uh, but afterwards, I mean, to her credit, she watched the entire thing and just, you know, just gave me a for shame dad and told me I lost points with her. But it was interesting because <laughs> it was, it was interesting because afterward I found me and my wife uh, hanging out in her bedroom saying like, Hey, just so you know, your mom and I watched this in our early 20s, and, uh, you know, your dad is, the, you know, what that movie is about is about not letting the world tell you what your station is. You're not, you, you don't have to be what you're born into. And I was like, look, I, I, I was a kid who was born into uh, a, 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 the son of an executive in middle management of, for a petroleum company. Bonnie's dad uh, managed uh, 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 Luby's cafeteria, um, and yet both of us punched above our station and did the incredible because, as Gattaca puts it, we saved nothing for the swim back. We somehow uh, carved out a life for ourselves with your dad being able to be a magician and then later, you know, a YouTube creator, whatever that means, uh, and, and your mom being a ceramics artist and all that stuff. Um, I, I, I don't know. I deeply adore that story, and I deeply adore that metaphor of the saving nothing for the swim back, which will make sense if you've seen the movie. If you've not seen the movie, I'll not explain the metaphor because it'll take something away from the movie. Yeah, and that's the movie that made uh, uh, Maya Hawk possible. Yeah. It's Ethan Hawk and Uma Thurman worked on the movie, and Maya Hawk was born like a year later. <laughs> oh, no kidding. Uh, yeah. Did you know that Maya Rudolph is in that movie? No. <laughs> yeah. I <did> not. Maya, <laughs> Maya Rudolph is, she has no lines. You only see her eyes. She happens to be the nurse that takes baby Ethan Hawke and holds him while they <laughs> do the initial analysis saying that he has a 99% chance of a heart condition by age 30. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's funny when you see people like in the small roles, then they just keep popping up. But yeah. I wonder if that's where the name come from. I like, okay, That's Thurman's exactly like, what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great name for a baby. 12 months later, Maya, Maya. I love that name. <laughs> but yeah, I just, yeah, I, I love Gattaca. I think it's, it's a, a very, I love movies that sometimes say, let's explore this idea. And, you know, this could be the way the world works or whatever. And kind of tell a story about you know, determining who you're going to be and, and whatever. And genetics can only you know, may give you abilities, but don't give you the determination or what have you. Um, it, it, it does suffer it, from that, that classic uh, blinders effect that, that 
oftentimes science fiction has where it's like we're in this crazy future, but they didn't see things like cell phones being a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing I like the most about Gattaca is that it's a big idea movie uh, with a gigantic concept that also never elevates itself too far beyond the moments of the characters. And that's what I've always like I always I always appreciated about it is that like you wind up leaving that movie thinking more about the conflicts of everybody that we watched and then also in appreciation of this larger kind of racism metaphor genetic babies kind of idea, which I think is just awesome because I think sometimes uh, those movies have a tendency to just get lost in 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 the sauce of the big idea that they're that they're trying to serve. Well, and I think that in the case of two, that that might be one where the uh, the director, the writer is it Nicole. I think he wrote and directed it. Um, may, and he's done other sci-fi stuff too. If you look up, he did like In Time and some other things. Like I, I think that it may have been a very much an intentional choice because sometimes really well done stuff, as you pointed out, Brian, they said it like give it this fifties aesthetic so it doesn't date itself. And the moment you have somebody pull out a device. You know, the the trend now is, is like now every sci-fi movie we imagine somebody's going to be holding on to some sort of electronic device. So they just make all of them transparent, which mm. is funny because you like you watch shows where you're like, that man, this person's reading a private email, but anybody sitting in front of them can read it through the screen because it's there. But it's just solving the problem of like, you know, every year it's a new iPhone and they get bigger, smaller or whatever. And so what do you do in 30? How do you do it for 30 years from now? And holograms and stuff, or just don't show them at all. You know, don't say they don't exist, but just don't even acknowledge them. Right. So, so, uh, man, um, I guess we should talk about this a little bit. You heard about the, there was an article about magic leap about kind of, uh, no. yes, I, I, I know nothing about this. I, I know that magic leap, uh, uh, which I guess only recently I found out was based in Austin. Uh, but but this is the augmented reality thing, right? Yeah, their their main headquarters is Fort Lauderdale. Actually, is the old Motorola factory near where Justin and I lived. Um, but I'm sure they've got facilities everywhere. Um, but uh, they had, you know, they've been Magic Leap was founded in 2011, and with the talk of you know um, they're going to be creating you know this next generation augmented reality tech, whatever. And eight years later, there was an article, I think it was The Information did this report, and other people picked it up and covered it, and their claims are that, you know, they had hoped to, because they put out their first commercial product, like, last year, their goal was that they wanted to, you know, the Abramovitz, one of the guy who created the company, wanted to sell, like, they wanted to sell, like, he wanted to sell, like, a million, and his people were like, no, adjust your expectations, let's try to sell 100,000 of these units, and according to the information, they're claiming they sold 6,000. Uh. Were, were they overpriced or was there un, were they under benefited? Mm, yes. Take your pick. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, it, it's it's always been there is uh, <laughs> tell you what, there there is there is a great story uh, that will eventually be told about the demo that Magic Leap used to sell their uh, uh, to to get funding because it was legendary even before people were paying attention to AR and VR in the mainstream way, uh, that this was life-changing. You could see the future with this, uh, all of a sudden a, a elephant appeared under a teacup or something like that, that was in this demo. Mm -hmm. And from that point, it was uh, got a ton, of, uh, a ton of money behind it. And all we ever heard was, it's years away. It's years away. It's years away. It's years away. And now it's been years. And the headline remains the same, that it's years away and they've released an iteration that was not great because the real cool stuff is years away. So, uh, uh, and then, yeah, yeah, take, take on top of that, the fact that they just, they did these other demos like the, the, the Weta, um, you know, shoot 'em up uh, uh, video that we're watching now, that was just, it was basically just a CGI tutorial like this this had nothing to do with what you would actually see nor have we gotten anywhere close to seeing anything like this yeah and then you had in the meantime you had you know the hololens came out you know you've had other stuff put out there other augmented reality tech both apple and google have done a lot now for software like google google has their own ar kit system and now they've added occlusion like apple has so you look at let's say you hold up your hand an object can appear in front or in back and that stuff and that the software has come along tremendously in the hardware because we kept hearing about like, oh, the device looks this. And 
And I wonder, like, I wonder now, like, how many of the people who were the early ones talking about how amazing it was had much experience with AR or stuff? Because you've seen this now, too, with some people who, even technology reporters who've never really tried some of the newer VR, like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Or, or, you know, people who are technology VCs and stuff who you realize, oh, they're not, they're totally unfamiliar with this sector. And so this demo is the most amazing thing in the world to them. But somebody else who's been playing around and stuff is like, oh, yeah, that's cool. That's like this. So I don't know. I, I, I've been was very hopeful that, you know, we would see something kind of really kind of awesome by them now. And I'm not writing them off, but it is, you know, eight years later and, you know, you people who've put this on, you know, my girlfriend tried the helmet and she's like, her description was, was interesting because, or the, 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 she tried on the device. She's like, it was a very small, small field of view that you saw the thing through. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, that's exactly it. You know? So, yeah. And the cost yeah. is very high. Uh, I mean, right yeah. now <laughs> they are selling the personal bundle of this for two thousand two hundred ninety-five dollars, up to the developer. There's, the, there's no real products. It's just a developer kit, so you can make your own whatever you want. I mean, exactly well, the two thousand dollars. Oh, there's there's a twenty-eight hundred dollar one that is a developer kit, but they do have a version of a glasses thing. You can get a glasses thing to put on your face look like one of the snapchat guys <laughs> yeah 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 i think you know it's gonna be one of these things that the, the overall area of ar we're gonna kind of look at it from afar and then one day you know be everywhere but when it's ready and i think for magic leap the challenge they have faced is you're trying to develop you got three problems one you're trying to develop this hardware this really amazing hardware for putting these images in front of you and you're limited by you know, uh, how much those little displays can put out there, whatever their formula for doing that is, the display technology, driving the display technology, your computer, which is processing this stuff because you're not just, you're trying to process, it's like VR, you're trying to process thing in multiple dimensions, all of this stuff. So you've got the hardware thing and how fast that's got to be and trying to scale that thing down because you look at like, you know, the, the rigs you guys use for your Vives, you know, you guys both use serious gaming rigs. You oh, know? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And, and, yeah, no, you know. There's a lot of so you've horsepower. Got the hardware, yeah, you've got the hardware between just the computer power and then the 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 goggles trying to look through. Then you've got your operating system, whatever code base you're using to try to figure out how to run everything, trying to build your own game engines or whatever engines you're trying to do, that kind of stuff. Then you have the problem of content. You know, solving any one of those challenges is what destroys companies. Trying to solve all three challenges is just that was one of the things from the get go. I'm like, well, this would be interesting. This takes off because, you know, you get, you know, game consoles are hard enough to launch and not to say this is going to be specifically game consoles, but to try to do an entire, a whole widget like this is just beyond me. Um, so anyhow, uh, we'll so see. Your, your pick I, I, is magic leap question mark. <laughs> uh, I just realized what we were going to do is that just came up and I forgot about it. <laughs> my, my pick is me remembering to do all the stories when we do the stories, Brian. That's my <laughs> pick. Uh, I got a pick. I went to go see the new Ryan Johnson film, uh, Knives Out. Uh, it is certainly a more of a return to form for Ryan Johnson past uh, The Last Jedi, which obviously has to kind of fit into a lot of different buckets. This very much feels like a Ryan Johnson movie. Um, you know, it, follow, it falls a little bit more into the into the, 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 the Brothers Bloom bucket for me, where I, I, I like it, but I don't know if I love it. But uh, it is still good to see him kind of doing his own thing, because I think he is far more comfortable in a world where he can control everything. And, and he always does just get very good performances out of his actors. Yeah, the movie's great. I, I loved it. Um, uh, fantastic murder mystery. It keeps you it keeps you guessing. It kind of uh, they, they they do in, introduce. I mean, you got to sort of buy into the conceit of the character who uh, I, I don't think is much of a spoiler because they say it within thirty seconds of her introduction. Like, what if somebody vomited every time they lied? How would that affect a murder mystery situation and uh what what could you assume and what could you not assume out of that and uh though I that, think that, that, that was fun like yeah. once you buy into that it's just yeah. silly enough that it's like yeah okay i get it that's the kind of ride we're in for and it doesn't well they yeah. don't lean on that 
idea too hard. I mean, they they have a couple of good bits and a couple of gags, but there's. there's I mean, still... it's it's a it's a silly movie, mm. and if you if you like, I'll just put it this way: if if you were really into Ryan Johnson because of Brick and Looper, then this will feel at times a little cartoonish and silly. If you enjoyed the levity of Brothers Bloom, then you will uh, you will also enjoy this because there are many colorful characters and some of which are are very cartoonish and some of which are a little bit more realistic. But ultimately you will you are you are in a world where there is a uh, a, a, a grand, uh, you know, Sherlock Holmes of the South, uh, who is, uh, uh, you know, going through this murder mystery of a murder mystery writer. Um, but yeah, it, it's uh, it's it, it's certainly worth seeing. My one hesitation is like, boy, was uh, you know, subtlety wasn't exactly. On the menu here for <laughs> Knives Out. It is. You mean the big, the big exactly. ring of knives that was just always looming behind people for various reasons. Well, well, and not only that, but also the fact that uh, the first interviews take place on the periphery mm -hmm. and they get closer and so closer to the middle, to where finally, for the first time, there's ever only after he knows who the bad guy is, does he sit down and the shot is framed. Uh, Justin, did you get? Did you notice? Uh, uh, when I watched it, I noticed that an awful lot of heads were cut off at the top part of the forehead. Uh, and and I know in the old days of film, that could have been a projection issue. But in digital days, I was like, well, I assume that has to be a quirky and very intentional decision, uh, which I took to mean as everything closing in, feeling tight and constricted. But But I don't know that everybody had that experience. Did you notice that at all? No. But... Okay. Uh, I, I mean, muted you, by the way. As soon as you started describing the story, Brian, I hit mute. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, there we go. Knives out. Cool. Uh, I got a pick. Um, so I, 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 I don't talk about this show too much, but I think it's very funny, and it just wrapped up last night. It is HBO's Silicon Valley. Uh, sixth season is its finale season, and uh, I, think, I think it ended in in the right way for for a show that has constantly been like you know grand successes and and then huge catastrophes for for the for the story for the characters involved um i think it makes sense the um <laughs> the way that they are their total abject success um can't just fail it has to like be an embarrassment it has to be like this this stain on everybody's record for how for for what they have to do i i think it's very clever um and and it, it, it's it's really funny i think it is a funny show um it it's so weird to think that it's been on for six seasons um I can't believe but, it's been so fast like it it really feels like it was just mm -hmm. introduced and i started watching it a few uh, couple of years ago but i guess it's been a minute yeah um but i think it's great Did any, anybody else here watching silicon valley i yeah i watched the finale last night um i i genuinely think obviously that it was a bit of a troubled production as was kind of uh, uh detailed and behind the scenes as behind the scenes stuff sort of spilled over um i i think that the show lost a little steam a few seasons ago when the powers that be running it and the stars on it started to become like when when silicon valley began it was this kind of curious look into an influential industry that america was kind of fascinated by but it was there was a silliness to uh and and, and a frivolity to the idea that silicon valley existed as it is i think the show itself began to take a far darker sort of look at it as more and more people started to get upset about the, uh, you know, a lot of the companies that they were modeled after. And I, I don't know if the show itself was necessarily better for it, but mm -hmm. I thought it was an okay season finale. Comedies are always so hard to wrap up uh, because ultimately it's like, how do you, if, if the point is always to, you know, end the show where somebody slips on a banana peel for the biggest laugh, uh, 
like how do you bring that to a satisfying conclusion yeah uh i i enjoyed it Mm -hmm. for a while and then it started to get very repetitive of like watch sort of we're gonna make these mistakes but in this location and these mistakes over there i always enjoyed the the performance is really good but and and there was like that yeah as, as it went from like hey aren't these tech bros silly to you know let's make a referendum about it it became i don't know a little too preachy for me Hmm. Um, but. Uh, I will say that the big thing that they did not talk about in this season is how jacked Kumail Nanjiani is, uh, <laughs> because I, I assume that this was shot as he was getting in shape for the Marvel movie that he's doing, where he is almost certainly going to be in Marvel shape. But like that dude has guns and they like, <laughs> don't mention it at all on the show, which I thought was like for a show like that, you'd figure, I don't know, you could have some little throwaway thing that he's, you know, just, you know, working out at his desk or something like if, that. If, if, if only a wink or a notice or, or just note, like, uh, 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 I've seen many programmers, they're not built like you. Well, just, yeah, because he's just like sitting down next to, uh, uh, you know, what's his butt? The other coding uh, dude whose name uh, I, I forget, but was in Party Down and Martin Star. Star. Martin Star, yeah, yeah, Freaks and Geeks. He's like standing next to Martin Starr and he's just got these like pro wrestler guns, especially next to Martin Starr. It's like, oh God, look at that. Oh yeah, I guess it makes sense. He's doing the Marvel movie. Yeah. Uh, I'll just uh, do a little throw out sort of pick. Uh, we've talked before about ways to sort of write, you know, and different like ink displays, stuff like that. And I didn't find any, I've tried a few of the, kind of the, some of the displays we talked about, some of the other tablets, and, and they didn't really suit me. But then finally what I did was I got a matte finished surface for my iPad. Just it's that sort of that kind of the, they call it like a paper finish, paper-like cover or whatever. And I got the Logitech uh, Crayon, which is sort of their, it's not the same as the Apple Pencil, but it uses the same sort of electrical field on the tip. So it's got pretty good precision on it. I've been using that. It was eight bucks for the little matte surface on there, and this was like fifty or sixty bucks, and it's been wonderful on the iPad as far as a way to draw and make notes and stuff. So, um, yeah, if you just do a Google search, like for like paper, like surface or whatever, or just any, there's a lot of different companies that sort of are selling the same material under different brand names and stuff. And I got one that I first, the first app, I pulled out the sheet, tried to apply it, completely screwed it up, got dust under it, whatever, did a horrible job, and I was really angry. Then I realized, oh, they gave me two. <laughs> the first one ah. is for me to practice all the mess up. Um, and got the second one on. It was great. So, yeah, that's a Logitech Crayon, which is a digital pencil for the iPad. So it's just a kind of a – it's meant for children, I guess, but works well for me. So Nice. So. How much was the, how much was uh, the Crayon? Like on Amazon, it was like 50, 60 bucks or something like that. That's not crazy. No, no. And it's it's a really good precision on it. It's got pretty good battery life on it. And what I love about this, oh, this is what I love about the way that the, let me show you, it's great about the crayon. The reason I decided to get that instead of the pencil, mm-hmm. to charge it, you plug it into your lightning port mm. versus the pencil, you got to plug it into your iPad, which right. sounds like a great idea. But if you want to use your iPad and not break off your pencil, yeah, you not so much. Sit your iPad, you know. Yeah. Where this was just such a this was this, and I get the Apple's approach was like, oh, what if people are away from their charger? How do they charge the you know the pencil? Oh, I just plug it in the iPad, which is great, but I prefer this much better. So nice. There you go, gentlemen. It's been weird. <laughs> All right. Hey, there we go, right. everybody. Yeah. yeah. I thought I think I saw Bonnie over there. Let me let me she check did. in. All right, everybody. We'll take a, we can jump in. We'll take a a little bit of a break here. So we get ready for after things. Thank you everybody for joining us. Seems like all of our uh, this is a lot of our tech uh, upload issues have been ironed out, at least a little bit. Mostly. Showbot.tv. We've got a few titles here. What was the one that I had? Yeah. Choose your own AI ventures. Pretty good. I think I think we'll go with that. Twenty sided AI, quantum dunks bit, energy plus energy, science. Energy. Yeah, we'll do choose your own AI venture. That's very good. Uh, then you do Bobcat. And everyone's got show titles. Use the biggest command. 
Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Busy weekend this weekend. Busy weekend this coming weekend. Um, being in the weekend. Uh, so we did our second second edition of Cutscene Theater uh, for Xenosaga Episode 2. Uh, on, oh, nice. Yeah, we did that on Saturday. Um, but I think we won't do Episode 3 this weekend. I think we'll do it next weekend um, because it's like eight hours again. And I want it to. I want to start early enough so people can like make it make a whole day out of it. Um, yeah. So keep an eye out on, on Twitter for that. Uh, it was so funny doing the second this episode two game because I I knew that the second game wasn't as consequential, um, but I forgot how angry how angry one part of that game gets me because you spend the first half of it. Like, oh yeah, we landed on the planet, finally. Let's do all the things, all the work that we're supposed to do. And um, you do like one one or two like things. And then it just like yada, yada, yada is you through all this like space adventure stuff. It's just like, oh yeah. And then this guy found the planet and then they opened up this route to it. And then everyone tried to go to it and some of the people succeeded and some of them didn't. Uh, but now here we are, we're on our way to it. It's like... <laughs> It's so frustrating yeah. because the everything up to that point was a lot of it is very dull. Um, and you can tell as they're giving you this like recap of stuff that they're not going to flesh out. Like there are cutscenes that you're there clearly like cutscenes and uh, stuff that they had started working on and then said, no, we're just going to just skip all of that. <laughs> Wait, what, which game was this again? This is uh, Zen oh my goodness, uh, Xenosaga episode two, um, between good and evil. Um, uh, it's a, an old, a classic PS2 RPG. So, Which one? Nice. Uh, Xenosaga. Oh. We're doing it on our on cutscene theater. Hit the wrong button. Uh, apparently. Uh, my sister-in-law just gave birth to her second baby. Hey! Hey! Is it twins? Was this expected? No, a, a sister-in-law. Second, second baby. Second baby. Second baby. Second baby. That's great. Congratulations. Yeah. So there we go. Mm -mm. Uh, Justin, did you need to go take a sec? No, I'm fine. You're good? Okay. Uh, well... Just rub your bladder in our your huge huge bladder in our faces. Yep, yeah. that's it. Keep it inside your body for a little <laughs> bit. Um, alrighty. Well, uh, do we know what we're gonna do for after things? Uh, I would love to hear a bit about Justin's journey, but I know also you. Uh, do we talk about your book writing stunt last? Uh, sorry, I don't know if stunt is domin diminutive on that yeah we talked about it last week so yeah we did talk about it okay know, right, how dare you call my stunt a stunt brian <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's like like oh do you prefer do you prefer uh do you call it magic do you, do you hate do you mind if we call it tricks you know like <laughs> you know, like i'm like i've had so many people like oh it's okay to call it a trick i'm like yeah, what a hole magician yelled at you for calling it something else? Yeah. Like, <laughs> how dare you offend my people by calling this tricks? Although I do find that uh, that that routine is a fine middle ground for that. Yeah, but you know, a dog can do a routine. <laughs> That's <laughs> you true. Know, dog, you know. uh, I rest my case. <laughs> Oh, it's, if I was saying like a routine, like ants have routines. You know, a trick is more specific, and like I don't, you know. I, I, I just the, you know the the, the offense that I've seen some people take to that you know, magicians would be like, I don't think the problem is the phrases people are using to describe your act. I think the problem is the act. Yeah. Agreed. Alrighty. Well, uh, if we're good to do after things, then hell's uh, yeah, Andrew, take it away in three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hey, that's me. So we had a pretty awesome thing happened. One of our own branched out 
into the more formal, idealized sort of podcasting world, I guess we'd describe it. Yeah, as a matter of fact, this is this is one of those rubber meets the road moments where it's like we uh, we we talk a lot of game about how to be a successful independent creator. It's it's this is one of those moments where we get to see whether or not our advice pans out. Uh, Justin, how's it looking <laughs> so far? Uh, oh, you know, I mean, uh, 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 good. Obviously, uh, uh, thank you to everybody who subscribed. Raise the Dead uh, was up in the top 100 for news. I think it peaked around the high 50s. Uh, but uh, the algorithm is far different than it was back in the day. I will say that there is a much less of a uh, uh, an onus put on new subscribers, it seems. Obviously, New subscribers got us up into the top 100, uh, and it kept us there for a solid, um, a solid, uh, uh, you know, five days uh, before it, it started to lose a little bit of traction. But I, I've gotten the sense in terms of some of my reading that a lot of that is based on new episodes. So it, it also rewards, you know, stuff coming out. Uh, so I would expect for it to go back up as we release the second episode uh tomorrow but so far the reaction's been amazing you know uh, uh i've gotten a, a ton of great feedback on it it's always heartening when when you know for for friends and fellow creators to say that they are excited by it and it makes them want to do other cool stuff that's like the highest uh honor in my opinion and the feedback from uh, the people have been great it, it's it's already got uh you know, I think over 200 reviews on on iTunes, uh, and and it's overwhelmingly positive. Uh, and it looks like it's on track to be the biggest thing that I do personally. Uh, so that it would it would have a bigger RSS feed than uh, than than politics, politics, politics. I'm I'm looking at like the top new shows and news right now, and it's on there. And you're ahead of like shows by MSNBC, Wall Street, yeah. you know, the Washington Post, whatever. Like you're, that's an amazing. You look at the the stuff you're launched with and the stuff that you're, uh, the other names around you. Like I know all these names. I mean, this is this is a very different podcast rule than it was five years ago, six years ago. And and the fact that you're just holding your own there is amazing. Well, yeah, and and that's the the thing that I've kind of had to. Uh, understand also is just that like this is not a show where like anything else i've ever done where i'm gonna put it out and people are gonna like get a sense of it but then past episode three or four they're gonna know whether or not they like me as a performer they like uh you know me covering stuff this is something that at a certain point will only get more and more complete to the point where it will just be one complete bingeable thing uh, so I am honored that people are really, really excited and are going to go week by week with me through the release schedule. Uh, but I, I also know that this is not something that's going to lose steam once we get to the end. You know, so, yeah. once once we get to the end, it's, it's it, there's an argument for it. It'll it gaining steam. Well, uh, you're go ahead. Oh, no, go, go ahead. I was saying, like, right now, like, you launched where you guys, what you did was on the steam of you and in your support you had for it. Now it is going to be the algorithm taking over as more episodes go up. And that's been, that's the fascinating thing is to see, you know, I've been watching this through Amazon and watching how that evolves over time. And, you know, how you get that second wind, which can sometimes be bigger than the first wind. When you get that first wind and there's genuine enthusiasm and people are listening to it. And it does matter. It actually matters now to listen to things and stuff and not like subscribe and forget. There's a lot of these things, you know, in, in 2019 are different than it was a few years ago. But I think because of the quality of it, I think quality gets rewarded more now, I guess is what I'm saying, than rather just blind press the button, get it. So, okay. man, I'm so glad yeah. to hear you say that because that was uh, the thought that I had. I'm sure we mentioned this last week is, you know, I, I reread for the second time the formula where the first law of success, as, as it's put in that book, is that performance drives success. And then uh, uh, down the road, the, there's the question of, in the arts, uh, when performance cannot be measured, uh, network effort, uh, effects drive success. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, we're a bit in the mushy middle. We're not exactly at trying to evaluate performance art or a Jackson Pollock painting or whatever, but it is clear 
the difference between a polished podcast and an unpolished podcast. And Justin particularly has been uh, doing, I, I think it's fair to say, low fidelity, high um, uh, iterations of his daily podcast and politics, politics, politics. Whereas this is a different game. This is very clear that hours and hours and hours and days have gone into the production of this. So I have to believe that that you're competing in a different marketplace than you've ever competed before. And that it's very clear to anybody who listens to the first five minutes of any of these episodes that all of a sudden it's like, this is a, a, a qualitatively different game that's being played. And in that case, uh, whereas, whereas I, I'm gonna say it's less ambiguous whether or not this is quality or not. And I think you're, we're closer to the first law of success where performance drives success. And I think that regardless of how you did in the first week, much like a Dan Carlin, you're going to, your work is going to stand on its own and it's going to be word of mouth that spreads the word on all of these. Yeah, and that's that's the idea. And, and you know, in this next episode coming up, there's uh, a lot of stuff with big kind of bold face names that you probably would not be aware of. Uh, and and that's going to be one of those things that I think uh, is where the research sort of shines. Uh, and and now I can you know sort of reveal our own history to us in a interesting and fun way. So if I if, if my tone is anything other than uh, being absolutely super excited, it is not because of anything other than uh, you know uh, I, I just I'm, I'm I'm as thrilled to put it out into the world as everybody else as anybody else is to to listen to it and and I'm I'm now just sort of uh, kind of re nervous to put out this next one and just kind of see where how that affects everybody. Which, 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 by the way, is the right time to be nervous because anybody could get excited for a launch. It's that week over week momentum that you should be uh, scared of. And uh, 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 good news, spoiler alert, the second episode is, is as good, if not better, than the first. But, uh, but I, I don't blame you for being nervous uh, because now you're establishing a pattern, you're establishing a trajectory, you're establishing momentum. Yeah. So, yeah. Go, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, question for you. So how many episodes are going to be in this run? Six. What? And I'm going to throw out, this is a dumb idea. I'm going to throw the dumb idea out there. Is there something to like episode three or whatever, launching a Patreon or something for the season two? So I've tried to stay away from Patreon for on this just because I'm already doing a big Patreon push on the politics thing. And that's mm -hmm. not to say that normally goes against my philosophy on Patreon, which is like, just make buckets and let people pay you money however they would like to pay you. Um, the the thing that is definitely going to happen is the ebook and the audiobook going up around episode three. Um, because that is the monetization strategy for this project. And I, I, I want to kind of get into that world. But uh, right now, I guess the Patreon has not been something that I've, that I've thought of largely because I still don't know exactly what I want to do for a season two and, and what kind of expectations I want to have on that. Here. Well, here's my, here's my thinking. I pay our Kickstarter maybe even, cause like, I, I, I think that monetization strategy can be helpful, but the challenge is that they have the content. They have the thing. You know, I'm listening. I have the thing that I like. This is the thing I like. And I, I don't, I do not know the appeal of the transcripts and I don't know the appeal of the audio book when I'm enjoying the thing. And I'm thinking like, I have, like, I don't know if I ever supported Defunct Land, but I know I bought the book they did because they did this sort of extra thing. And I was just, just throwing that out there like, is there like, oh, it started out as like, hey, you like this? We're gonna, I'm gonna do in season two of Raise the Dead, you know, and help yeah. me pick the topics. So the the the, the audiobook and the ebook both have an, a bonus episode that you that is not going to be released in the public right. feed. So that that is that is the enticement of why you would want to support the 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 project and also the idea that you'd be able to listen, you'd be able you would be able to binge everything now if you got uh, those in either in either those two mediums. Um, but yeah, 
I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's the other thing is that I've, I've seen Patreons for similar podcasts and they all feel a little awkward. Like, I don't know if I've seen a Patreon for anything like this that uh, I've, I've, I felt uh, is, you know, totally that I felt happy as a, as a contributor to, mm -hmm. you know, I think I, I, I started, or I, I was a patron for the cocaine and rhinestones one, you know, when they first ended it, um, or first began their Patreon. And, but even then that's like pretty much just the dude making a YouTube video once a month talking about his research process, uh, which is fine, but I, I don't know if I feel like pumped for it. So I don't know. I mean, there, there is, yeah, I, I, I don't have a good answer as to why not, I guess. Brian, your thoughts on that? On, on specifically which aspect? Well, the idea of, of while he has people listening to this is to basically use this as a pitch for a Kickstarter podcast for the next one. Normally is a way to sort of harvest. Normally I would be in favor of if you have attention uh, and I think we've talked about it a little bit on this show but I'm developing this this model this this picturesque circle that story attention sales and it goes in a circle uh, each one serving the other master uh, when you have attention what you don't want to do is try to go backwards imagine that overnight you became famous for being the guy who barfed up uh, a perfect rainbow of unicorn flavor uh, colors or whatever, then now that you have all this attention, you're like, oh, what I want is credibility. So finally I'll cash in on story. That's you going the wrong direction uh, uh, because you'll be laughed at for your poetry if you read it on your channel now that you have attention. So going the right way around would be to go ahead and do all the ad dollars, be the guy who puked perfect, uh, perfect rainbow, and then eventually you'll be able to buy the artistic support and writers and development that will uh, earn you a legitimate spot in the uh, story side of things. So likewise, in this case, um, I think that Justin is has harvested uh, the goodwill that comes from 11 years of being in front of a camera and being in the ears of a passionate community. Uh, the good news is that the story element, that currency is so very, very strong in this that I think it will stand on its own. And I, I would, to my surprise, Andrew, I guess I'm saying uh, I would encourage him not to harvest in this case, but instead to double down and, 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 and reinvest in the story side, build up that mm -hmm. goodwill. Like if he can get some number of people across the line of six episodes because podcasts especially limited edition uh podcasts that that stay around for years and years and years they tend to pick up fans years after the case and so at three episodes in i don't know that you've earned enough to harvest much but at the end of the episode if the last episode ends with do you want to follow what's next now let me harvest by getting you to sign up on my email list or getting you inside the fold of the patronage or whatever, that feels like the right call to me because that will play. Yeah, I guess that's, yeah, that's exactly it. I guess that's the thing that concerned me is just the idea. If you have a thing out there, let's say it's getting hundreds of thousands of downloads, but because it's this isolated separate thing, it's not like a YouTube channel or something else. Then when Justin does a new thing, people may never know because I bought, I downloaded this, I found this solid podcast on iTunes. I listened to it. I love it. This is great. And then it reaches its completion state in six months down the line, three months, two weeks, whatever. He puts out something new. He can always put an episode saying I've got a thing new, but the number of people that are going to listen to that versus listen to two of the peak periods of that. And that's the thing that makes me go like, man, is, is that losing the opportunity to either do a well, harvesting and, and, or collect uh, those this names. is actually a really good point so so uh when you experience a peak i think it's important to dial in on who is it that makes up this peak for example uh in the run-up as we got close to a million new, uh subscribers on the modern rogue channel we uh the algorithm I, I i suspect there's a little bit of kind of a rubber banding that happens where as you get close to a milestone the algorithm just makes you a little more approachable and, and spreads you to more folks. So all of a sudden in two and a half, three months, we got nearly 200,000 new subscribers. And uh, that is showing its face as we 
do stuff. I, for example, w- some of our classically most popular episodes have been a couple on cigar smoking, right? Uh, kind of fundamentals of understanding how to enjoy a cigar or whatever. And even when those came out, there was some number of those people that were like, cigar smoking? What, what do you love, cancer or whatever? And we're like, no, we just like cigars. That's, that's a thing. And so now... Uh, two years after those initial episodes, we did a sponsored episode. There was a cigar club that sent us a thing to unbox. And we're getting some number of people that are very clearly part of the new 200,000 subscribers who don't know the past history of us being guys who really dig cigars. So for them, it's a bit of a shock, a surprise in their minds, off character, or you know, like like like, what do you love, cancer? And we have to all over again say, no, we just like cigars. And and so likewise, I think that um, it's important for Justin to recognize that 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 in the future there'll be people coming to his story after the fact, and it's only after they've bought all the way in. It's very difficult to spend three and a half full hours listening to to Justin at his most polished, at his best, and then have a small ask of join our club and, and say, no, you're a jerk. You know what I mean? Whereas it's easy if you're midway through that process. Yeah. So Justin suggestion, would you be, how hard would it be to put like a MailChimp sign up on raise the dead? Oh, not hard at all on the website. Yeah, I think that might be a th- again. I don't again. I don't want to be armchair quarterbacking, but we're just you know, hey, it's what we do after things. I wonder if you did a thing like that because that could be a thing like, hey, if you want to keep up to date what I'm doing, what's coming next, whatever you know, and about information about Raise the Dead season two, you know, just have an email harvest, you know, just start collecting those. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, certainly that is uh, that's. Uh, uh, you know that that is that's that's definitely a strategy. I, I definitely should. I know you're overwhelmed, and I apologize for that. I'm just just, but I'm just thinking out loud, going, "Oh, hey, here's the thing." You know, like how do you, how do you cap? Like what we did with my books was at the end of the book, I put my email address and say if you wanted to follow further, and I built up my email list from there for like my books. You know, and that was super yeah. instrumental for launching new books was because just a few hundred people, because the ones that said, "Oh yeah, I want to follow, I want to follow them. How do I do this?" But it's got to be put in the idea. I got to put the idea in your head. Yes, you can follow me. This is where you can get more info, you know, through the email. A few hundred people on that list at the, at the, at the start was amazing because those people were the first ones to buy the books and to review the books. And, you know, versus just a, a list of a bunch of randos. So anyhow, again, you've what you've done is amazing. And I know the workload is incredible. And I'm just I, I, I apologize for saying this, but I feel like as your friends would say, like, here's a thing to maybe think about for, you know, like episode four or whatever. No, no, no. It's definitely good advice. Yeah. So um, uh, I'm excited. It's nice to watch this. I was just telling my girlfriend about how it's neat to see a friend who's great a lot of things and great at stuff find a focal point for the thing and to make a thing that's a really defining kind of thing. And I think that, you know, this is you know, could be a gateway to other opportunities and stuff. And it's nice to have a thing to people go, you know, what do you do? And, you know, to, to pick a thing up and say, I'm in that's what you've been doing podcasts and stuff like this, but to saying like, this is the best representation of what I do. You know, this thing here, you know, will give you a really good idea of what I am. And I like that you have this now. Yeah. I mean, I think probably the best, uh, the, the coolest feedback that I've gotten so far is, is kind of along those lines of people saying just like, you know, Oh, I never really totally like listened to something that you did and, and said, Oh wow. Like that's, that's it. This is what you were meant to do, which is cool. That that's, that's really, really rad to hear. And, um, you know, uh, uh, I just hope people like it. <laughs> oh, Brian, you want to read the the gun bait comment there? Uh, which one? Oh, oh gun bait says uh, Justin Robert Young. Uh, I normally don't take too well to politics. As a matter of fact, I despise them. However, your new podcast, uh, hashtag Raise the Dead, is fantastic. It's very well produced. Your cadence mixed with your excitement made it quite enjoyable. I can't wait for the next episode. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I, I don't think I've shared this with Justin yet. I've encountered that sentiment full on in the wild, like hanging out at the Wizard Academy on Friday. 
there's a there's a friend of the show that uh, that has only recently kind of fallen into our ecosystem that walked up it was and it was like he was walking by and we we're doing our regular hey hey how hey and then he stopped mid tracks and then turned and he goes Justin's podcast and then suddenly no words were spoken but I was like right and he's like holy I like I mean that that's what makes me think that you are you're 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 firmly rooted in the performance dr drive success uh, category of the formula. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's you know, I, the 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 biggest thing is just dealing with other creators. Like that, that's where I know that it's like other people who have done really cool stuff recognizing it as really cool stuff. And also, it's just uh, when when the the feedback has kind of come from outside of the core demo. You know, there's a lot of people that are like aware of me, but aren't like Night Attack fans or aren't PX3 fans um, or Weird Things fans that uh, have have reached out and said really rad, th re really really rad stuff. And I, I suspect that you know, as we continue to go further into this story, and uh, you know, the, the the cool thing now is like I know what's coming. <laughs> And like, I, I know that there's a lot of really red, like this is not a front loaded thing. The best episodes of the series are toward the end. So, uh, I'm, I'm just, I, I hope other people agree. <laughs> That's exciting. Very excited for what's going to happen. I mean, it just, just following the journey and what comes next and all that. And, uh, very, we're all very, very proud. So we're trying to say we're all very proud. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, thank you. And I've been, you know, I've been recommending it to my family members and stuff. I was talking to some political stuff with my brother yesterday, who's, you know, not a technology guy. I'll put it that way. And, uh, yeah. you know, we're talking about some political thing. Like, oh, you should check out Justin's. Like, oh, send me the link. Da, 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 da. So, you know, I mean, it's just, it's neat to have that kind of thing. You're like, brother, have you heard the word? So. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think that's, um, I did an interview with, um, uh, our our friend Meryl Barr, who writes for Forbes and uh, you know covers streaming and technology, and he's he's a screenwriter himself. Uh, but he interviewed me on his podcast, Word Tetris, about just kind of the writing, and it was it was a really cool experience because uh, this is an application for you know a lot of the stuff that Andrew and I talk a lot about um, in terms of like structuring a story and creating characters and creating a narrative that uh, can can kind of engross people and, and bring people in. And that's always tricky with history stuff because, you know, you can you can be tempted to, to want to sort of uh, shift away from the literal truth so you can make your larger point. But thankfully, the characters that we're dealing with here are are kind of <laughs> So so big, and uh, the, the the stakes are so high that really the question was more uh, what you you know how you focus the story as opposed to um, you know making anything up. Wonderful uh, picks, picks, picks. Ooh, hey, uh, uh, man, uh, I uh, I don't know what I got for you in terms of picks. I, I'm. I'm trying to try on some different apps, but I haven't really found anything new in the games department that I that I super duper love. Uh, do you do you have a recommendation, Bryce? Uh, I, yeah, I actually just started playing uh, an Apple Arc or it's on Apple Arcade, but I think you can get it on PC too. Uh, it's called Discolored. Um, it is a sort of first mm. person puzzling game, so kind of kind of misty. Uh, it's it's really short. Uh, I I've, I've just found out. Uh, I started playing it because The Verge wrote an article about it, and I had already downloaded it, but had never opened it. And I started playing it this morning, and I think I am almost nearly done with it. Oh, wow. Um, so it's it's about two hours or so. Uh, but it's it's an interesting uh, sort of game where you are in uh, uh, this little vignette, and there's no color, uh, and you do different things to bring color to whatever the space is. Uh, I think it's I think it's neat and it's certain I think I think for a short puzzle game it's cool. I think the thing it's sort of missing is uh, logic. You know, you just kind of do things and you. It's kind of like an old adventure game where you just you get stuff the, the, and you find only a three hole. things to do. And once you've tried two of them, guess what? 
the right answer is. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, but if you have our Apple Arcade, I think it's it's neat. Uh, oh, uh, and uh, they make uh, so you, you know that they the 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 PlayStation and the Xbox controllers now work on the iPhone um, built in. Uh, they make. Uh, I'll, I'll find the Amazon link and put it in the show notes. But they make controller uh, supports. So you you clamp clam it over the center of the controller. And it's got a little, just a little hinge on it that you can put your phone in. And so you can basically play your phone mounted on top of this controller. So, cause, so you're not doing like the on screen joysticks. Yeah, sure. Cause those always stink. Not a fan of that on screen experience. It's not great, but um, almost all, every Apple Arcade game I've tried to play using the controller has had controller support. Um, so I think, you know, and the thing I've got is super cheap. It might have been $10 maybe. Um, so I think I think that's a really solid way to go too with uh, the Apple Arcade. So it's a discolored. Oh, it's, yeah, same about getting a controller and discolored looked interesting. I read some reviews that were sort of meh on it, but it looks beautiful. And and you know, and I hear a two-hour game, my ears perk up because yeah, like, I mean, I mean, welcome that, to my attention span. That yeah. that's the the beginning and end of it, right? Is it's if you can get over the fact that you really aren't given any story, uh, you're just kind of doing this thing. Uh, I think it makes. And, 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 and you know that it's going to be short from the get-go, I think it, it's... Uh, <laughs> I don't want to say it's, it's tolerable because I think the puzzle stuff is, is, is really neat. But, you know, I think it's, an, it's a nice little experience. Cool. Anyone else? Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I watched Mr. Robot. That's ending. That's about the end of my thing. So What, what did I'll, you think yeah, of... I, of all, all those Three loose ends, they sure are being tied up. Mm -hmm. So if you've been enjoying Mr. Robot and want to see all those loose ends, well, now you don't up, want answers or what? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I do, but but it's weird to. I mean, look, uh, there are certain shows that have earned the right to drift across the finish line. You know, uh, Game of Thrones was one, Mr. Robot's one. Uh, but that's the thing you say when you don't like how the season's going. <laughs> well, it, it, uh, it, it, it's fine. I mean, they, they already have resolved the major, the most major points. Mm. And from here on out, I'm minorly involved in like, well, I'm happy those two got together. I'm happy this person found that. I'm happy they figured out a better solution than originally proposed. Um, you know, we're getting to that phase as we get to the end where it's like, Remember this character who was a big deal for about seven episodes and then vanished? He's uh -huh. back. Ever wonder what happened to him? I, this mm, end I, of episode. It, it is. <laughs> this is a very sort of tough episode. The one that just came out this week because it follows that really dense, very heavy, very you know, big action sort of episode. Um, uh, and I know you don't watch the next week on stuff for Correct. for the shows, but there are still two things two very big things left unresolved that I think the next three episodes sure have plenty of, have just enough time and we don't, I and we don't and have to deal ha with the people that said were it, in those episodes. Uh, having said so, uh, uh, this, this <laughs> week was a, a, a fine vignette. It was a very sweet story that I, I liked. Yeah. Uh, but also, I mean, if I was going to pick one episode to seduce someone into getting into Mr. Robot, it probably mm -hmm. would not be one of the last four episodes of season four. <laughs> not even, oh, <laughs> you know, okay. Well, you know, that's, and that is the, 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 the challenge is like, because I think part of the big frustration with Game of Thrones last season, the last few seasons was it was wrapping things up and not telling us a story. And, and this is how this ends. And this is how that ends. It's like, man, thanks, Wikipedia. <laughs> and right. But, but, but again, but again, like if it's earned, I think you get to get away with that. Right. Uh, I, yeah. Or at least in my heart as a fan. Well, Game of Thrones got snubbed at the golden globes and you know, the reaction for the final season, certainly. I mean, when you have, yeah, I feel so bad for the actors because they have to be, they're so defensive over it because it's, they've been so criticized for things that they put so much hard work into it. And for people feel this amazing gift all of a sudden didn't give us everything we wanted and the bitterness, but it is hard, you know, but mm -hmm. I like Mr. Robot. I watched the first two seasons, but then I just sort of like kind of, a, it was sort of like me and like Legion. I'm like, ah, cool. All right, I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll like it if I watch it. But there's a lot of other stuff out there. Yeah, the uh, around the end of season two was when I felt uh, it got a. Uh, uh, I don't want to. If I say in the weeds, it's going to sound like I wasn't enjoying it. I enjoyed it even mm -hmm. then. But you could tell it was mm -hmm. like, oh, you're going for some really big, big, you know, out there stuff. 
Um, uh, I've enjoyed season four m- more that they've sort of decided to wrap it up and they're kind of collapsing things, and, mm-hmm. and that's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I should get back into it. I, your recommendation has swayed me, Brian. Yay, yeah, nailed it. <laughs> Noted. Like my book list is now things Brian told me to read that I didn't get around to reading, and then I started reading. And go, man, this is amazing! I gotta go. <laughs> By the way, I derive cool. a much. I I derive so much joy from being that guy that, that gets you to to read all that. Yeah, you are. You are, sir. You very much. Um, uh, my pick is. Did I talk much? I, I I mentioned that when I did my try to write a novel in a day, um stunt um it was uh i used the google voice recorder but then i started playing around the otter.ai and then i'm like i wonder what's like the best transcription service i can find out there and so i played with uh i built an api for working with google's speech to text and then i tried amazon's with punctuation so i compared otter amazon and google all three of them together to see which ones gave me the best results and far from a scientific uh experiment i came away with otter being the best out of them um the the one difference is that in the amazon's plugged in its own api system so unless you want to build something that's not really practical between otter and google i think otter was better now the difference though is the google recorder which is the app they have on the pixel phones which now works like they're expanded to other android phones is completely free and so it does transcription on device, so it's completely free. It provides you a pretty simple transcript with timestamps and stuff and a voice recorder of it so you can use it free forever on your phone and never have to pay anything, anybody, whatever. Otter costs money at certain tiers, but Otter is – it's one month. Like you get 600 free minutes a month, and then if you go to like $10 a month, it's like 6,000 minutes, which is – if you're trying to use Google's API service, like basically like build an app to use it on your own, like I've done, it's way more expensive than Otter. Otter's got the best prices of anything that I've seen. So uh, if you're looking for a cool app on the iPhone to do transcription, um, otter.ai is great. If you want, if you have an Android phone that will use Google Recorder, then you can use Google Recorder and pay nothing forever. But otter.ai is, is my pick. The long way around it, folks. Otter.ai. You heard it here first, people. Happy. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but record is great too. But Otter.ai, like I just looked at the quality and it's very good. So, there you go. Nailed it. Yeah. Sweet. It's been after. Hey, look at that. We did it. We All righty. Hey, everybody. Thank you for showing up for Weird Things Today. We'll be back in a couple hours with Cord Killers. Justin, you got any streams? Uh, how's, how's the internet looking over there? You, you... <laughs> well, we got we got a lot of trying to make sure that things work yeah. in the future. That's what we got on the horizon. Well, you know, when you live in a backwater that's as far away from the center of the tech world <laughs> as possible in Oakland, you can't really expect much, Justin. So. Fair point. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Alrighty, well then everybody, we are uh, oh my god, all of my family is now texting me. All right, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we love you guys. We'll see you guys soon. Bye. See ya. Uh, Bryce, when you said that, I imagine like an Eddie Murphy movie with like you in every role as like a family member. <laughs> it never started right away, it didn't wanna let me get too far from here. I was still too young to realize It's like you ever have a friend and like you meet their sister and the sister's really